So we should go straight to questions. There's first one up the back there. Uh, Alan Murray with the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I profoundly agree Thanks. with Tom Ferguson's point. Next one. I'm sorry, do you want no, me no, to No, no, keep going. Yeah, I'm okay, saying good. First, yeah. I, I profoundly agree with Tom Ferguson's point that polarization is core to the problems facing structural adjustment in the United States. I thought his narrative was a bit one-sided. Uh, certainly the Democrats have their own web of relationships that pull them into extreme positions on things like trade, education, legal reform, um, immigration that are equally detrimental to making the adjustments necessary. And I think if you look at it in that light, Martin Wolf's point about plutocracy disappears. Uh, the Tea Party is anything but a plutocracy. The plutocracy could solve this problem, but they're not in charge. But, but I don't really want to argue that point. I probably have already done so too much already. Uh, the question I wanted to ask Professor per Ferguson was, I was surprised that he so quickly dismissed the role of redistricting in what, what happens in Washington. I mean, it seems to me that there were some key court decisions in the 1970s combined with uh, the power of computers and the wealth of demographic and voter data that starting in the 1980s has led to a conspiracy of both parties. Now, this is the one area where there's been some bipartisanship a conspiracy of both parties to draw congressional districts that are essentially political ghettos. And the result of that is that you have an entire generation of politicians in this country who have never had the experience of having to reach across the aisle and appeal to people from the other party. It's simply not in their skill set. Uh, the most they have to do is generate enthusiasm among the base voters in their district. And it seems to me that that is a, uh, a profound reason for the polariz polarization in Washington. Tom? Well, the short answer is it's not. And the evidence on this, I think, is conclusive. I think Sean Thoreau's book on polarization or the review of the whole discussion in Fiorina's Disconnect is just, is, it just settles. I mean, there are some outstanding, there are cases. And what I said in my paper was very precise. There are certainly cases where you can see ridiculous gerrymandering and redistricting schemes. But there are a lot of cases where, in fact, what they do is they, for instance, don't change the party strength or balance that much. For instance, in California, uh, right at the time that DeLay and company were trying to redistrict in the Texas legislature to sort of get, create more districts in, a, in an early census reapportionment, Carl Rove and company were doing a deal in California that essentially froze the Democrats in place. I mean, no, I, I'm sorry, I just think on this one, uh, it's time for journalists to sort of look at some of the statistical evidence. And I, I think Fiorina and Thoreau have really done the work here. Can okay, I now, now, I down the back, yep. Um, it's also for Tom Ferguson. Um, um, the no, get the microphone. Get bit, yeah. uh, so, uh, we, we, can't, we can't hear. Uh, my name is John Smithin um, from uh, York University, Toronto, and I hope Tom uh, doesn't mind an uninformed question about American politics from uh, north of the border. I get them all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, you, you talk about polarization, but would you not say that the polarization is also around the wrong issues from the strictly economic point of view that we've been talking about um, you know, today? And I'll put this in two ways. One, by analogy, I, I read a lot about how the libertarians, for example, cannot find a political home with the conservatives, right? But by analogy, uh, where in fact would be the political home for the moderate economic views, which I think it's fair to say have been expressed uh, a good deal you know, during this uh, conference, um, in, including from politicians, admittedly politicians from, from Europe, where is their political home? I could also put that historically too, that there seems to be something missing from the American political scene that was there historically, and I'll just summarize that by, okay, you know. Qu quickly, uh, we've only got a few minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, fe by Federalists uh, and Alexander Hamilton and so forth, that strand of politics which seems entirely absent now, uh, where has it gone? Okay, uh, you want me to answer? Or you... Yeah. Okay, I had only 10 minutes, but John, I entirely Actually, agree. Actually, you took 20, yeah. yeah whatever <laughs> I took. Whatever, whatever it, I took, it wasn't enough to get into these issues. 
Uh, the, uh, I mean, I, I didn't give a speech about how we needed like more study of complexity. I actually gave you an analysis of some complexity. <laughs> you're absolutely right. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right that the sort of public issue discussion is in fact a, a, at best orthogonal to uh, the type of issues you're talking about. That, that's at the bottom of this, what, uh, just very quickly, you've got two, and think of it as t not one, but several multi-divisional blocks of cash on each side that then reaches out selectively to interest groups in society. The public discussion then mostly concentrates on whatever interest group each side is trying to reach out to. It m mainly doesn't touch the sort of main economic issues. That, in a sentence, is what I think. Okay, another question uh, over there. There's a mic coming. David Vines from Oxford. Can I ask uh, Martin Wolf and Marcello De Cecco to just describe to us how they think this not working cooperative game might play out globally? There seem to be three players. The Chinese story Martin is optimistic about, and I would agree with that, I think. Adjustment is difficult, but might happen, and probably too slowly. The German-European story looks disastrous and is likely to give the world much more to worry about than China, and I wish people on this side of the Atlantic would start refocusing their worry. And thirdly, the American story. If the Chinese adjust too slowly and the Germans refuse to adjust, then what we need to keep the world recovery growing is massive fiscal indiscipline in the US in the short run. But what we need in the long run is some clarity that when we get through this short run process, there will be discipline in the US. And that makes this game really hard to play out in that we need a credible expansionary policy in the US that we all know will be bring, brought to book when the time is right. Absent that, uh, I see real troubles, and I wonder whether the two of you see the same troubles. So, Professor Checker? Well, last year I was invited here, and they gave a paper which uh, Martin Wolf would agree with, because it said exactly what you said. They are bankrupting. Europe, the Germans, the trouble is that there is a lot of schadenfreude on this side of the Atlantic about that. And because they had, they took fright about the euro before some people in, not in Washington, but in New York. They really thought we had, we were on to a good thing and they, we might replace the dollar and we might replace the, uh, the city of New York as opposed to the city of London. So I wish you were right, that they would start noticing what's happening in Europe very fast and with a polarization which has got nothing to envy the polarization of the United States, only it is done by countries rather than done by, uh, how do you say, classes or uh, plutocrats or whatever you want. So uh, the thing is that I think that the structural problems with the US and Europe, inside Europe, because you know, the miracle was performed, as I wrote in my paper. Europe is, uh, has no imbalance. Inside, however, it has only an enormous imbalance. But if you look, the outside has been solved. You know, the euro played its game, you know, it performed its function, which was to give the Germans a lower exchange rate for than the mark would have been. Now, we keep telling them, imagine what it would be without the euro. Where would the German reborn, born again mark go? Through the roof, of course. But they know somehow that the euro is not going to collapse, and so they keep doing it. I called it German industrial policy through the euro. You just kill everybody else and make a domestic market in which only <laughs> German goods are sold, plus a little tourism by whoever is able to run tourism on, uh, <laughs> you know, it's an agro-pastoralization of the south of Europe, to use Morgenthau in this room. Thank you. I couldn't have said it better. And, 
And since I played a small part in keeping us out of this catastrophe, I feel quite pleased. Um, the, I think that describes very well. Uh, I believe the Eurozone will stay together. I believe it is going to exert enormous deflationary pressure on all countries which are fiscally weak, which basically means all important countries except Germany and a few very small countries which don't really matter. And therefore, uh, the Eurozone will be able to sustain levels of activity at all if it moves into substantial external surplus. The, it's an absolute obvious point that Germany is turning the Eurozone into itself and that becomes a very giant export-led growth economy. Some of the countries will not be able to sustain this so they go into permanent recession. Um, how this plays out in the very long run, that's a very interesting question which I don't have time to discuss, but the short to medium run is exactly as David describes it, so it's obvious. China, uh, I have nothing to add to that. It seems to me, I think very much with, goes with what Louis said, there's going to be adjustment. It will be quite slow, but there will be adjustment. We are talking about a 10-year horizon, not three. Things don't happen in China over three, but uh, they will happen and China will adjust. Uh, that then leaves us to the US. Uh, I've been uh, arguing in various speeches in the US over the last three years that what the world is going to have is an unsustainable recovery, which is much better than no recovery at all, but obviously it has relied on US fiscal policy above all. And, uh, and uh, I think I'm ri with Richard Ku, I think that can be sustained for quite a long time, but uh, it's going to create problems at some point. And uh, when it does, we're going to have another round of very major global turbulence. So that in terms, of the, in terms of the discussion of our subject, not only is there going to be no cooperation, but there's clearly going to be chronically inadequate adjustment. Apart from that, everything's fine. <laughs> And I'm sorry, that's, uh, I'm sure there's lots of questions, but we're, we've got the, uh, the wind-up signal, so I'd like to thank all on the panel uh, and the audience as well. Thank you very much.